Happy Sabbath, everyone. It's good to see you all. I was supposed to be at Loma Linda Group today, but I had some personal excuses uh, for the coming week. We are going to go to Loma Linda Group. So please uh, excuse us for not uh, being present today there. But I hope there was a good food, good people as always. So I hope everyone has been enjoying your past week, but also have more higher uh, expectations for the coming Sabbath as well. Uh, before we start, uh, let us uh, pray uh, so that we can invite our Holy Spirit to be present with us today. Uh, thank you, Lord, today uh, for bringing us out of office, out of our personal lives that have been going on crazy this past week. As we are here, we are willing to listen from you and we are willing to open our hearts before you. So, Lord, uh, take us all uh, to the holy divine worship to experience your holy presence. I thank you and we love you. I pray in your name. Amen. All right. Uh, today's uh, passage is going to be the Church of Laodicea, right? The last church of the seven churches, the Church of Laodicea. However, uh, I hope that we have pretty much all covered from last week's uh, sermon by Mark. And thanks, Mark, for a perfect timing and perfect message that fits our church well. So I would like to skip pretty much a good part of the passage. Well, we were, we we're going to uh, read out uh, the, what the passage talks about, but um, I would like to pass uh, pretty much skip every part of the scripture since you have or Mark has shared a good part of scripture for Laodicea. All right. It starts from chapter two or three. Uh, verse 14 to 22, till the end of the chapter. And after this, now we enter to the scene of the, the holy temple in the heavenly kingdom, which starts from chapter 4. So I want all of us to stay tuned as we face the last, uh, last churches and seven churches. 14, it says, And to the angel of the church, a loud is and right. These things say to Amen, says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither, neither cold or hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing. And do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments, that you may be clothed. That you, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. As many as I love, rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him, and he with me to him overcomes. Who overcomes? I will grant to sin, grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on this on his throne. It's 22. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. As Mark has shared us um, last Sabbath, Church of Laodicea pretty much represents the churches in the modern times, in modern Christianity. I have um, shared with um, our church for the past two months that each of the churches represent that each of the periods and causes of the Christianity uh, ever, since it, ever since it has begun from AD 100, right? However, Church of Laodicea pretty much represents the church in our timings right now in postmodernism. Well, we know about uh, some few backgrounds, how rich they were, how f not really lacking anything and their finance, and their medical medication. Also, um, there was one thing that they were lacking that we are always uh, knowing well of, which is being a lukewarm church. And we also know that um, the city of Laodicea were always lacking water, just like California, I believe. So they were lacking water. They were always bringing some water uh, from the other cities. But remember, they were in a desert, so... Whenever the water comes down to the city of Laodicea, because of the hot weather, it would always make the cold water, ice cold water, 
into lukewarm water. And that is the reason why John was asking them, do not be lukewarm, just like the waters that you guys consume or drink. Also, John is asking them, please get the, get the gold refined in the fire and the white garments, the salvation coming by the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Also get an eye solved that you can discern better. However, there is a distinctive part after all of this that really touched my mind this morning, right? There's the part where it says, here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. I hope this has been an image for most of the Christians when we think of Jesus knocking at the door of our mind, our life, and still asking to get a permission to come into our life as well, right? And I wanted to really know or discern what that really means when Jesus is knocking at the door before us. Perhaps um, I have genuinely thought about that um, Jesus knocking at the door means that I have to open my door and go to some place to meet Jesus where he was. he's waiting at for me. But what the Bible is actually telling us is that like right at the in front of the door, Jesus is standing right there. So all of the things that we have to do is opening the door. However, you might notice that when you have to open the door, you have to know who the visitor is or who is actually visiting you. The face of them, the relationship that you have of the visitors so you have, so you can uh, open the door. Uh, there are some times that I get off of work around like 3 p.m., sometimes like 6 p.m. Like it's not really certain that I, when I get back um, to home from my work. And even though I do have the home key, sometimes I really want to see how my wife is reacting to my uh, homecoming, right? So sometimes I just like knock on the door without opening the door with the key. I just knock on the door. And I hear she's saying, she's asking, who's that? Who, who is this knocking the door? And I purposefully nod um, answer back, right? Just, just because I want to feel like I'm a, I don't know, surprise, surprising invitation or surprising visitation to my own home, right? And I see a look at her face when she opens the door. Sometimes she like opens it this bit much just to, to, just to check out who's um, visiting our own home or just to, just to check out, right? Or sometimes she's opening the door. She, she can already tell that I am waiting outside of the door and she opens it all the way, open up all the way with a like big smile on the face, like you finally got back home, right? And this has been pretty much for the last past weeks since I have gotten back from my trips for the conference meetings, right? So what I'm trying to say here is that whether you open your door of your mind or your life or even to your own home depends hugely on the relationship that you have of with the visitor. If you really know Jesus, if you really have a personal relationship to Jesus, you would never hesitate to open your mind door. However, if you feel like you have heard of his name, if you feel like you've seen him once in a while, but you don't really know him or do not, do not really have a personal relationship with him, you would hesitate or even not go out to open the door. Excuse <coughs> When you go to Matthew 25, it writes a story of the 10, uh, 10 virgins. And five of them were wise virgins, and the other five was unwise, foolish virgins as well. And the Bible writes their distinctive difference between these two groups were whether they were having the Holy Spirit, which is the oil, right? The one group had the oil for the wedding, and the other group was not having an oil, or right? what they consumed at all during the night. But we are too concentrated on the very fact that you having it or not, but we really get to lose the real main focus why the other group was not able to make it inside the wedding party, right? You're gonna be surprised for this. When Bible says this parable, Jesus is not opening the door or the bridegroom is not opening the door for the wedding party, not because they were lacking the oil. He says, truly I tell you that I do not know you. And I was shocked when I actually figured this out. These five women 
women were not able to make it to the wedding, not because they were lacking oil, but because Jesus or the bridegroom did not know them personally. It was rather about a relationship than them being perfectly prepared. Sometimes we are just focused on how perfectly I can get ready in order for myself to get into heaven rather than looking at someone else actually still and already waiting for us outdoor in my life, right? The only thing we have to do is just opening up the door. Sometimes we just lack that relationship that we hesitate to open the door. When you go to Matthew 22, it writes a story of uh, the wedding party again. But this time, the bridegroom is actually inviting everyone, no matter how good they are, no matter how bad they are. Sometimes even the murderer, the bridegroom is actually inviting every people into the wedding party because the previous ones have not answered to their invitation. So what you still get from the story is not that you being perfectly ready for the wedding party. It is rather how much you know him personally. And whether you opening up your mind, your door of your life to his invitation or not. This might be a bold statement, but um, as I was studying through this and listening to various sermons, the pastors, we were all so sure that these five foolish women would still have gotten into the wedding party if they personally knew Jesus. Yes, they might still like the Holy Spirit. Sometimes, yes, they might still like the oil in their life, they might not be perfectly ready, but if they knew Jesus, Jesus would have invited them over to their personal place and then gave them, anointed them with the Holy Spirit that he had in his house. <clears throat> There's a book called The Psychology of Money. And I was studying through the author with his interview and I, I got to witness a, a, a amazing point with Morgan Housel was making a point in his book, right? In this book, he's making a point whether that the person uh, spending his own money does not depend on the money itself or the investment method itself. It rather depends on the psychology of the humanity. Let's say you have $1 million in your bank account, and that is the pretty much entire money you're going to make in your own life, right? One million. You're not going to make more. You're not going to make less. And you have to um, make that money valuable enough so that once you retire, you have to feed yourself. You have to survive yourself with that $1 million of, dollar, $1 million of money. And you have that $1 million. And one day, Pastor Suman comes up to you and asks you, oh, should we invest into Bitcoin? It seems like Bitcoin is a huge success nowadays. Should we invest that $1 million into the Bitcoin so that we can make it a little more? How would you react to me? You're going to say first, what's wrong with Pastor Suman? Is he out of his mind or something? Right? That would be your first initial reaction. But secondly, you're going, to start, you're going to start doubting about it. Is Bitcoin really the method, good method, perfect method that I can preserve my money or sometimes even make a double of my money? Right, you're going to start doubting. So in the end, you you might make an investment. You might not. It's like 50-50. Or sometimes it's like 7-30. You might not make it because you already have like $1 million. And then the next day, your teacher from your kid's school comes down to you and tell you that your kid has such a potential of becoming a great athlete or a great doctor or a great CEO of some certain companies. And all you got to do is to send him to the good private school, spend your all $1 million to educate him, to make it into such a better figure so that he can make a, your kid can make a good, uh, huge success in his own life career. But the side effect will be that you lose all the money you have in your safe account, savings accounts, that you might not have anything for your retirements. Because I do not have any kids, 
this is not a concern for myself, but if you go and ask all the kids to your all the parents that have at least one or two kids, they for sure are going to say that the reason, the only reason that they are making money is to invest and make their kids a better life, to give them better life to their own kids. They're not going to doubt about it. They're going to spend every single cent they have in their bank account to make their kid better. What it says is that spending your own money does not really depend on the investment method or the money itself. It is rather, it's not in the system, it is rather a psychology of your mind, of the humanity. Just like this, when Adam and Eve were sinning with their first behavior, I believe it hugely depend, depended upon their mindset their relationship that we're having with their Jesus rather than uh, depending on Jesus' visitation. When you go to the scene of Adam and Eve making a sin with the fruit of knowledge, <clears throat> it was not Jesus who stopped coming to the earth. Jesus still came to the life of Adam and Eve and asked as if like nothing has happened to Adam and Eve, even though he knew everything has taken place to the life of Adam and Eve. But it was rather Adam and Eve who stopped talking to him, who started hiding behind the scene because they knew something has changed in their mind. That they knew they were not able to talk to Jesus again personally, openly because of the sin that is taken into their mind. So today, coming back to the story of the Church of Laodicea, more like all the invitations that have been sent out to the seven churches, we see them, and sometimes we feel like, so how perfect shall I be before those invitations? But I pray that those prayers might not be our prayer today, since I really love how these seven churches appeals to us and in the end where God is telling us that he is still waiting for us outside of our door and our life. When you actually look at Church of Laodicea, there are so many things that were lacking that it never gets any of the compliments. That's because their life was a total mess. They thought they were doing well. They thought their life is a well-being, but in, in, the, in the reality, their life was a total mess. That is the reason why the Bible could not, could not really say anything specific of the Church of Laodicea, because they were a total mess. But still, God was waiting out the door, knocking at us, asking for us to have them inside. So maybe, may our prayers be open up our minds so that the heavenly kingdom that is all already ready before us be adopted in our, in our mind, be accepted and be received in our minds so that let us be transformed. As the Bible says, the coming of the kingdom is not something that can be observed, nor will people say, here it is or there it is, because the kingdom of God is in your midst. The only very thing we have to do is to accept him, to receive his invitation, to just open up. Just like your boyfriend and girlfriend, or sometimes just your spouse waiting outdoor for your opening up door. Right? Let us open up and invite him over. Uh, I would uh, ask us to go into our opening discussion today. We have a special game that is ready for today. Um, and I want you to <clears throat> figure what God is really trying to say uh, say to you, or what has been the message that you have gotten from the seven churches' epistles. Uh, I want us to remember that there was an initial message that we shared when we started the seven churches. They all belong to some certain <laughs> some certain period of Christianity or the churches, but also they represent our personal steps that we are having in our faith journey, right? 
So I wanted to think about that and share with your people as well. <laughs> Today's opening game will be, uh, who am I, right? I want you to uh, get prepared with the pieces of paper with the number amount of <clears throat> all the small group members that you have in your groups, okay? And I write down the names of church member, church family. It could be only your small group or it could be someone else from the church family as well on the little pieces of paper, one by each. And you can pick one pieces of each when they are ready, okay? Put the paper on your forehead once you have it, but you cannot see the paper. And try guessing your uh, name on your paper by others' uh, help of a hint, all right? The paper wearer or pretty much everyone can only ask yes or no questions to try to guess the name on their forehead, all right? Uh, I hope this could be helpful a piece of uh, thing or a activity that we can find a message from our church worship today. And I really thank you for coming to our Seguros Worship uh, small group again. Hope to see you tomorrow as well. Have a happy and blessed Sabbath.